And just when I was starting to think that the Linux space might settle down a bit, we get the Nouveau maintainer resigning, we get LTS Linux kernels moving from 6 years of support to 2 years, and we get Fedora proposing to ditch X11 entirely, not just for KDE, but for GNOME as well. Oh, and also GNOME 45 is out, Ubuntu 23.10 has a beta, and Vulkan on Linux is getting massive performance improvements. And you're getting this segue to our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Chasm Workspaces, which is a great tool to stream any operating system, desktop or application straight to your web browser. They just released version 1.14, which adds translations for 243 languages, along with a completely redesigned administrator user interface to streamline administrative workflows. Additional updates include support for local webcams and printers, plus the ability to persist your data to cloud storage drives, like Google Drive, Nextcloud or OneDrive, along with saving your persistent profile to S3 block storage. These updates make it easier than ever to host on-demand access to your desktops and applications. The Chasm Workspaces Community Edition can be self-hosted, or they also have a cloud SaaS subscription. So to learn more about Chasm Workspaces, click the link in the description below. So potential bad news for NVIDIA users on Linux. The primary maintainer for the Nuvo project has now resigned. Nuvo is the open source kernel driver for NVIDIA GPUs that, while not really usable as a daily driver for newer cards, is perfectly fine for older NVIDIA GPUs, and also a crucial part for all the work currently happening with the open source Vulkan NVIDIA driver called NVK. So Ben Skeggs worked for Red Hat and has contributed to Nuvo for more than 10 years, and he posted his last patch this week to indicate he was resigning from Red Hat and from Nuvo development. He says he's leaving things in a good state now that the GSP firmware work has been merged, which should make supporting newer hardware easier than it was when he started working on this driver. And while there's a lot of development happening on the OpenGL and Vulkan front for NVIDIA GPUs to get a solid open source driver going, they still all need the Nuvo kernel driver to handle the base hardware, which means the departure of Ben is a big blow. Still, Ben merged the necessary patches for enabling good performance for NVK with support for the GSP firmware that lets RTX series GPUs be reclocked and thus provide adequate performance. While this isn't enabled by default, it can be turned on with a kernel option, and this work might be upstreamed in the Linux kernel 6.7. So let's hope other contributors will be willing to pick up where Ben left off, but one cannot blame a developer for working for 10 years on something like Nuvo and wanting to do something else now. So congrats to Ben, thanks for all the hard work, and here's hoping that Nuvo can continue being developed. Now we have some big changes for the Linux kernel in terms of organization at least, as the long-term support versions will no longer be supported for a very long term. Previous LTS kernels were supported for six years, but they will move to two years instead. The change was announced at Open Source Summit, and the rationale behind this is that no one uses very old kernel versions anyway, so there's no point backporting fixes and security patches to these. As an aside, the currently supported LTS versions go all the way back to 4.14, released in 2017, which I'm pretty sure isn't used much nowadays, apart from a few select servers. This combines with the fact that kernel developers are apparently burning out on this kind of work, although supporting Rust in the kernel is expected to bring in some new blood. So the currently supported kernel versions will run their course, ending their support in at most three years, in December 2026, but all new LTS kernels will only get a two-year support window, which is pretty fair since most LTS distros get a new version every two years anyway, and a lot of them already move to the latest LTS kernel version during their life cycle. And I can't say I am opposed to this change because, yeah, LTS distributions that are virtually the only ones to use LTS kernels 
already tend to move to a newer LTS version mid-cycle because you can't really keep the same Linux kernel for six or eight years depending on how long your distro is supported. And of course, it might impact some use cases, but how many big deployments are still on 4.14 these days? Now, of course, this week we also got the release of GNOME 45. It brings a lot of small changes from the new activities button, which is also a workspace indicator that you can scroll over to switch between virtual desktops, to a new quick setting toggle to handle keyboard backlight, improvement to background app support, a revamped cursor theme, although very slightly revamped, the new split header bar design that brings an updated look to Nautilus, the settings and a bunch of other apps, plus big improvements to the compositor and Wayland, notably handling the mouse cursor in its own thread to reduce latency and a lot of improvements to the default apps. There's also a new image viewer that is way nicer to use with touchpad gestures, a new camera app, the calendar gained infinite scroll in the month view, Gnome Web got a new tab overview grid, there's an experimental light theme you can turn on in Dconf, Gnome software better handles Flatpak uninstalls and warns you of outdated unmaintained apps, and the settings gained a new privacy hub, more Wi-Fi settings, and a brand new about page with more information about your hardware that you can copy easily to the clipboard. On the less good side of things, it also breaks all extensions since GNOME moved to a new spec for JavaScript in the shell. And while a lot of extensions have already been ported, some might not be just yet. Still, it is a very solid release that I obviously made a dedicated video about. So go check that out if you haven't watched it already. It's like two videos before this one or something. It's, it's, it was published this week. Now, other cool GNOME-related changes include the release of Newsflash 3.0, the excellent GNOME app for reading RSS feeds. It got a complete redesign, plus support for drag and drop to move feeds into categories, a better mobile experience, and it should also be way faster to load articles, to sync feeds, and to mark stuff as read. It will also remember its window state, it can open images from articles into a big window, and it better handles article thumbnails. And RSS is still the best way to get your news, your videos, your podcasts in all one place without any algorithmic BS. And you can add virtually anything and most clients will now convert any website to an RSS feed, even though the website might not have one by default. And there are also new releases for Railway, a GNOME app that lets you plan your travels using public transport. Jogger, a fitness tracker for GNOME Mobile, a massive update to Workbench, which is a must-have app if you want to learn to develop GNOME apps, a new update to Turtle, a Git repo manager that plugs into Nautilus, and a new version of Letterpress, the app that lets you create ASCII art. Now the GNOME ecosystem is as vibrant as ever, maybe even more vibrant than it was previously. And that's something I really miss now that I moved to KDE because KDE apps might be good, but they are not as good and they are not as many as the ones you can find on GNOME. And it's something that is really striking now that I use KDE every day. Now in other distro related news, Fedora 39 got a beta. They moved to GNOME 45 in its most vanilla configuration. They also use the latest Linux kernel and they ship with the latest versions of Firefox and LibreOffice. And all their official spins are also available with the latest versions of their respective desktops. So Plasma 5.27.8, XFCE 4.18, Budgie 10.8, Cinnamon 5.8 and LXQt 1.3. No big changes are planned to Fedora-specific software like DNF or the installer. DNF 5 still apparently isn't ready for Fedora 39 and the new Anaconda installer isn't either. So they've been pushed back to at least Fedora 40. And speaking of which, it looks like Fedora 40 might bring another change that will prove to be more controversial than the others. While the KDE spin already proposed to ditch X11 from the install, the GNOME edition also now has a similar proposal. Since Wayland is the default for the standard version of Fedora and has been for a few releases, and considering X11 isn't being tested and requires some effort to maintain, they're considering dropping it and compiling Mutter, the GNOME compositor, without X11 support. 
Of course, as with all proposal for Fedora, it still needs to be approved by the steering committee. Now, it would be very interesting to have a major distro like Fedora completely drop support for X11, if only because Fedora is the exact kind of distro to do these kind of changes on, and also because it would mean that a lot of issues could be reported for Wayland, which would accelerate development. Because if you have X11 as a fallback, you might not even report the issue and just move back to X11. If you're stuck on Wayland, then you're going to report the issue and the developers will sort of have to fix it because there's no fallback. Now, Ubuntu 23.10 is set to release in a few weeks and the beta just dropped. It also brings GNOME 45, of course, with all the new stuff I mentioned previously, apart from some of the default apps that Ubuntu doesn't ship, and with their usual customizations and changes. It will also default to the minimal install option now, which comes with just the essentials, Firefox, a terminal, a text editor, and the store. You can still get the usual roster of apps by selecting expounded installation instead, and of course, if you upgrade from an earlier version, your apps won't be removed. There's also the new app store called App Center, which seems like it definitely added back support for Debian packaged and apps from the repos, which is good. There's a new firmware updater tool written using Flutter, like most Ubuntu specific apps, and Ubuntu 23.10 uses the Linux kernel 6.5, so the latest currently available. Finally, you'll be able to use disk encryption with the TPM chip your computer probably has, although it's experimental and it won't work if you dual boot or use the proprietary NVIDIA drivers. So all in all, it looks like a solid, non-controversial release. Like, it's good that the App Store gained support for dev packages back because just having snaps would be extremely limiting. So yeah, expect a dedicated video when it releases. I think it's on October the 12th. And let's finish on the gaming news. First, we all know that Valve made Linux gaming possible and is definitely helping Linux gain more adoption, but it looks like they're actually a way bigger contributor than I thought. At Open Source Summit, there was a talk from Igalia, which is a prolific contributor to a lot of parts of the open source stack, and they pointed out a lot of Valve's contributions. Through SteamOS, they not only fund Proton and Wine development, working with code weavers, but they also fund some Linux kernel work, like the Futex API. They helped solve case-insensitive support for X4 for better Windows app compatibility. They contributed to the AMD RADV drivers, to the ACO compiler for shaders, or to Vulkan to better support video playback. And they're also helping the currently ongoing work to support HDR, to better handle GPU resets, and they support Flatpak through SteamOS, they developed the Gamescope Compositor, and a lot more. And of course, a lot of this work is related to stuff that directly benefits Valve, because it helps them sell more Steam Deck and gain more independence from Windows and Microsoft, which is their goal. But in the end, the whole Linux community benefits from that because it's open source work, and it's exactly how stuff should work between the community and a company, and I think they've set a very good example here. Now, the Wayland driver for Wine also got some improvements with a new set of patches posted for review. This time, it enables window management, including resizing windows, moving them around, using the right cursors when hovering over stuff, closing windows through the compositor by clicking the little X button, and other basic window management things. And it might seem like it's really simple stuff, but it's definitely needed to ensure that games running through Wine on Wayland natively work normally. So at some point, all of this has to be implemented. It's not just fancy Vulkan work and hardware acceleration. Sometimes you also have to implement the very basics. And we can also look forward to some nice performance improvements for gaming. Mike Blumenkrantz, working at Valve on the Linux graphics driver team, has managed to optimize the code for Vulkan, up to a thousand percent faster for certain Vulkan operations on AMD GPUs, and up to 5,000% on ARC GPUs. So, of course, it won't translate into that kind of FPS increase in-game, but it should definitely make our gaming experience faster, at least when using Mesa drivers, so with an AMD or Intel GPU. 
And we also finally have a merge request to implement the Wayland Color Management Protocol in Western, which is the reference Wayland Compositor. Now, to make things clearer, it simply means that we have the first implementation for specifying the color space and the HDR data on Linux. It's still missing a few parts, but it's a big, big step for HDR support on Linux. So yeah, this thing is happening and I have no idea how well it links with the support for HDR and gaming that Steam baked into Gamescope, but yeah, HDR on Linux, it should not be too far off. Just like this segue to our sponsor is right there. If you need a new computer and you plan to run Linux on it, you should probably stop looking at devices that come with Windows pre-installed and you should buy a computer from a company that actually supports Linux's development, like our sponsor, Tuxedo. They make laptops and desktops that ship with Linux out of the box. They pick the hardware specifically to run well with Linux. And if they detect various compatibility problems, they submit patches upstream to fix them for everyone. And they have a big range of devices that should cover every price point and every need, whether you're looking for a small laptop, a giant gaming laptop, a tower, a NUC for office, for productivity, for video editing, they have it all. All the devices are very customizable. All the laptops can be opened, repaired, and upgraded. So if you need a new computer and you want to support Linux's development, click the link in the description below and get yourself a computer from Tuxedo. They are really, really good. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't, there's always that dislike button and you can tell me why in the comments as well. And if you really want to support the channel, there are also plenty of links in the description of the video from LibraPay to YouTube Thanks, PayPal, Patreon, you know the drill. So thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!